Hello. There we go. A little better. Happy Friday. Can you believe after a, a full, a full, really miserable week, now we fortunately get a three-day weekend. Boy, isn't that nice, right? After today, you can say you survived one week of BB451. Pretty good for that, right? You're 10% done with BB451 after today. You gotta look at the positive side of things, guys. All right. Well, I was very happy. I've been uh, having some of you come to my office. I'm happy to meet you. If you want to come, say hi, whatever. I'm happy to sit down and talk to you, get to know you, and so forth. So please do so. Don't be a stranger. Um, you don't have to make an appointment. Just come on by. Um, if you want to see my calendar, send me an email. I'll send you my calendar. You can see uh, whenever I'm not in a meeting, I'm generally in my office. So uh, come by, and I'm happy to connect with you. So. Um, Somebody pointed out that there doesn't appear to be a place to put today's video. There will be. Um, the uh, calendar's a little screwed up for a couple of things. One is that I think I created originally for that week zero thing uh, in the fall term. So there's only a couple lectures that first week where it says week one. And the other was, I couldn't remember if it was that or uh, we had a snow day one year and that screwed up week one. So uh, in any event, the, li the, the lecture will be linked um, and so forth. Um, one of the things that happens this term that's a little different from 450 is, uh, yeah, I, I cover a lot of material, but I cover even more in 450. So this term, it turns out, we can go at a little bit slower of a pace, uh, and that gives a little bit more time for review and things like that, which I think students appreciate, and certainly I appreciate being able to do uh, as well. So hopefully you won't find this term to be quite as strange of a pace um, if you follow my lectures in BD 450. Okay. Well, um, I hope everybody's watching the videos and getting some uh, useful information and so forth out of those as necessary. You don't have to, but if they're helpful to you, I hope that you are taking advantage of them. Last time I got started talking about the glyoxalate cycle, and I pointed out to you that the glyoxalate cycle um, is a cycle that uh, is found in plants and bacteria, and it is a way um, of bypassing some of the reactions of the citric acid cycle. So the, the glyoxalate cycle has all of the enzymes of the citric acid cycle, not all of them are used. Uh, and in addition, it has two enzymes that are not found in the citric acid cycle. One of those is this enzyme right here, isocitrate lyase. And I didn't show you the reaction, I told you what the reaction was last time. And I'll show you here for those of you that are into structure. Again, you're not having to memorize structure. But if you remember that isocitrate is an intermediate in the citric acid cycle that has six carbons. And isocitrate lyase cleaves off two of those carbons um, to uh, make the molecule of glyoxalate. That's what this guy is over here. And, and that leaves behind four carbons uh, to make a molecule of succinate, which is this molecule right here. So I talked about those last time. This is what this enzyme uh, looks like. Okay. Now, um, really not much more to say about it than what you see on the screen. Uh, the enzyme is not made or is, isn't found in animals, so we can't do the glyoxalate cycle, and that has some implications. I mentioned those briefly last time, and I'll say a little bit more about them uh, in just a minute. The second enzyme that uh, is unique to the glyoxalate cycle is uh, malate synthase. And again, it's an enzyme that's found only in bacteria and plants. It's not found in people. And this enzyme uh, takes two two carbon pieces and puts them together to make a four carbon piece. Okay? So the two two carbon pieces are acetyl CoA, which you have seen before, and this two carbon piece of glyoxalate that was made by the isocitrate lyase. If you put the acetyl part of acetyl-CoA together with glyoxalate, you make a molecule of L-malate. And I hope you remember from last time that L-malate is one of the intermediates in the citric acid cycle. So um, as a result of action of these two enzymes, what has happened is the cell has made a molecule of, of uh, succinate, and it's made a molecule of L-malate. And as I pointed out last time, Succinate can be converted into L-malate just by the enzymes of the citric acid cycle. And so as a consequence with this uh, uh, setup, 
The cell at this point has two molecules of L malate, where it started with one. It started with one, because remember that we had oxaloacetate, it's a four carbon piece. If we do a citric acid cycle, we add a two carbon piece. We have two decarboxylations, and we come all the way around, we make malate, we make oxaloacetate. So we start with one oxaloacetate, and we end up with one oxaloacetate, meaning in the citric acid cycle, which is what I've just described, in the citric acid cycle, there's no net gain of oxaloacetate. On the other hand, in the glyoxylase cycle, we have two, not one. We start with one, we now have two. That means each turn of the cycle of the glyoxylate cycle gives us one extra exaloacetate, or malate, or however you want to count it, because everything's ultimately going to be made into exaloacetate anyway. If we have two exaloacetates, that means that the cycle is spinning off one each time, and that one can be used to do something else. Can't do that with the citric acid cycle, because once we get back around, we've got to reuse that exaloacetate. So we can't spin anything off or split anything off from the citric acid cycle, but we can with the glyoxylate cycle. Not we, bacteria and, and plants can do this. Now, what they do with that commonly is they will use that to make glucose because exaloacetate is an intermediate in gluconeogenesis. As I pointed out last time, that means then that plants and bacteria can make glucose in net amounts from acetyl-CoA. We can't do that. Now that has some important implications. Okay? We can't do that. I'll emphasize that. Right? If we could do that, boy, dieting would be a hell of a lot easier. Why is that? Well, let's, uh, one of the things the body needs to function is glucose. We'll see that over and over. You saw it in glycolysis. And we know that glucose, as I mentioned before, is an immediate source of energy. That immediate source of energy is always needed. So if the body starts getting low in glucose, what does it have to do? Well, it either has to eat some, right? Or it has to synthesize some if there's no food around. Well, how do we synthesize glucose if there's none around? We, as animals, can't use acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA comes from, you say, well, it comes from glucose in the first place. But acetyl-CoA can also be made by breakdown of fatty acids. We'll see that. Wouldn't it be nice to break those fatty acids down, take that acetyl-CoA, and make it into glucose? Because now I have a real good pathway for breaking down fatty acids and making glucose when I needed it. And I would be breaking down fat as a consequence. I could have a real quick weight loss scheme if I could do that, but I can't do that. So if I have no other sources, I've got really got two options. We're gonna talk about one of them in a minute, okay? One of the options is to use amino acids. One of the options is to use amino acids. We can take amino acids, for example, alanine. If we take alanine, we can very easily convert alanine into pyruvate. And what can we convert pyruvate into? acetyl CoA, right? So we can do that. We can also go the other direction and take pyruvate and make what? Glucose, right? So pyruvate can go either way. We can make acetyl CoA for the citric acid cycle that we can use, or we can use it to make glucose in gluconeogenesis. So by breaking down amino acids, we can get not only energy in the form of acetyl-CoA, but we can also synthesize glucose for other purposes. Both of those are very, very useful things. Okay? Now, so that is why the breakdown, uh, I'm sorry, the, the acetyl-CoA uh, not being made into glucose is really important for animals. Okay? We can't do it, but we have a great way to lose weight if we did. Well, let's take a look then at the um, comparison then of the citric acid cycle versus the glyoxylate cycle. Okay? In the glyoxylate cycle, we input four carbons, two molecules of acetyl-CoA. We release no carbon dioxide. There are no decarboxylations because 
the isocitrate lyase and the malate synthase are bypassing the decarboxylation reactions. That's what they're doing. The glyoxylate cycle produces one extra oxaloacetate, and the glyoxylate cycle has two oxidations. Succinate dehydrogenase and malate dehydrogenase are both part of the glyoxylate cycle, just like they're a part of the citric acid cycle. However, we're missing those two oxidative decarboxylations of the citric acid cycle, so we only have two oxidations, whereas in the citric acid cycle, we have four oxidations. Okay? The products of the glyoxylate cycle include one NADH, one FADH2, and one extra oxaloacetate per turn of the cycle. And there's a net synthesis of glucose that can be made from acetyl-CoA because of that oxaloacetate that I've been hammering into your heads. The citric acid cycle, by contrast, inputs two carbons in the form of one acetyl-CoA. It releases two carbons in the form of carbon dioxide, so we put in two carbons, we lose two carbons. That's why there's no net amount of gain of uh, carbons. And there are four oxidations. Three NADHs, one FADH2 and one GTP per turn of the cycle. There's no net synthesis of glucose possible from acetyl-CoA using the citric acid cycle. Okay. Now, um, when does one cycle versus the other run? Well, as you can see in the cycle, it's really critical that the cycle have the citric acid cycle and the glyoxide cycle, but primarily the citric acid cycle have plenty of NAD and FAD because they need more of it to make more NADH and more FADH2. The citric acid cycle is therefore more dependent upon NAD and FAD than the glyoxylate cycle is. When will a plant or bacterial cell decide to run this cycle versus this cycle? They're probably both running in many cases, but the glyoxylate cycle is gonna be preferred when NAD concentration is low. It's going to be preferred because it doesn't need as much NAD. It doesn't need as much FAD. When that cycle's low, this guy isn't going to run very much. Well, what happens when that gets low in us? What happens when that, that NAD and FAD concentration gets low in people? We're going to talk about this a little bit when I talk about electron transport. One of my favorite topics to talk about is respiratory control. Respiratory control. You hear that? that term, but what does it mean? It means that these reactions that we're talking about at the cellular level manifest themselves in, physio in the physiology that we have. Okay? A prime example is what happens when we run out of NAD. Let's imagine that you're sitting here like you are right now. A couple of you are eating something, which is good. It makes me hungry, but that's okay. Uh, and you're sitting here, you're eating something. Some of you are drinking something, okay? How's your level of breathing, high or low? Your level of breathing is low. You're not exercising. You're not getting all excited about what I'm saying, even if I wanted you to be. You're just sitting here going, oh, shut up, Ahern, right? You're just kind of sitting here, right? Your level of breathing is low. Your oxygen level, consequently, is probably a little lower, right? What's oxygen needed for that we've talked about? Making NAD in the electron transport system, right? What's your level of NAD? Probably a little lower because you're not breathing much, you're not bringing much oxygen in. Your electron transport system isn't going crazy because you're not really doing much energy-wise. We'll talk about that in electron transport. So your NAD levels are probably lower. When your NAD levels are lower, okay, what happens to your citric acid cycle? It slows down because there's not as much NAD. If the citric acid cycle, and by the way, I had a student in my office telling me this earlier today. I like you to think about these things in terms of if this, then this, if this, then this, if this, then this, if this, then this. It's so much easier than memorizing every single situation that could possibly happen. We've got a situation where you're sitting around, you're not using oxygen, and you told, you told me, or I told you, 
As a consequence of that, your NAD concentration is relatively low, which means your NADH concentration is relatively high, right? You have one versus the other, right? It's a zero-sum game. NAD concentration is low, citric acid cycle slows down. What happens when the citric acid cycle slows down? What's the input for the citric acid cycle? Acetyl-CoA. What happens to your acetyl-CoA concentrations? They're going to go up because you're not using acetyl-CoA, right? Acetyl-CoA is not something you want to have a concentration go up. I'll tell you why. When your acetyl-CoA concentration goes up, the first reaction of the citric acid cycle goes just fine. You can make citrate. But citrate goes up when acetyl-CoA concentration goes up. But you're not running a citric acid cycle, so citrate isn't getting converted into anything else. Citrate concentration goes up. Your mitochondria say, I don't want all this citrate in here. Put it out in the cytoplasm. Put it out in the cytoplasm. There's an enzyme out there that breaks citrate into acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate, the opposite of the reaction that you saw that made citrate. What have I just done? I've moved acetyl-CoA from the mitochondrion out into the cytoplasm. Everybody see that? By carrying on the back of citrate, I've moved acetyl-CoA from the mitochondrion into the cytoplasm. I get it out in the cytoplasm, you got bad news, because in the cytoplasm, acetyl-CoA is used to make fatty acids. And when you make fatty acids, you're going to make fat, Yeah, my New Year's resolution, right there. OK. If I want to lose weight, what do I have to do? Well, <coughs> what's that? Cardio, did I hear somebody saying? OK, we'll talk about that. All right? But basically, I want to exercise. Because when I exercise, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to my oxygen concentration, or my oxygen consumption, rather? I start breathing heavily. The reason I start breathing heavily is my electron transport system is sucking oxygen. So I start sucking oxygen, right? My electron transport system goes like crazy. What happens when my electron transport system goes like crazy? What happens to my NAD concentration? Goes up. When my NAD concentration goes up, what happens to my citric acid cycle? It goes up. What happens to my concentration of acetyl-CoA? It goes down. And I'll tell you a little secret we'll talk about later. Pyruvate is not the only source of acetyl-CoA. Fatty acids are too. So now when I start dropping my concentration of acetyl-CoA, I'm not only going to break down pyruvate from glucose, but I'm going to break down fatty acids to make acetyl-CoA. If I want to lose weight, I damn sure better start exercising. One of my New Year's goals. Yeah? Can I say that question? Will hyperventilate for an hour? Will that help you? Well, hyperventilate, that's a good question. Will hyperventilating help you to do that? Okay? No. We'll talk about that. It's a good question. It's not a dumb question. Actually, it's a good question based on what I told you. That's a logical conclusion. But there's one other factor that we'll talk about with respect to electron transport that prevents that from being useful. That'd be nice. Because then I could just sit around and get excited about biochemistry. I could hyperventilate about biochemistry, and I would lose weight. I wouldn't have to exercise. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Good question. Good question. Make sense? These things are all interconnected, folks. That's what respiratory control is all about. Everything is connected. And it's connected in such an intricate way. First of all, that's very logical. If you if you learn the system, I could throw anything at you. You could tell me exactly what will happen by going this goes to this goes to this goes to this goes to this. OK, questions about that? Clear my? Not a clear mic. I'm in trouble. Sorry. OK. Well, that's what I want to say about the glycolate cycle. That's what I want to say about, we just started talking about respiratory control. We'll say a lot more about respiratory control when I get to the electron transport system and oxidative phosphorylation. 
Because it's there that's the heart of respiratory control. It's really the heart of respiratory control. Okay, well the last thing I want to talk about here before I move on to talking about lipids and membranes is to talk about acetyl-CoA metabolism. I've been talking about acetyl-CoA, I've even been talking about a little bit of acetyl-CoA metabolism, but I haven't given you uh, a bigger picture. That's what I hope to do here. Acetyl-CoA is one of the most common molecules we find inside of cells. It's like pyruvate in that sense. Pyruvate is abundant in cells. Okay? Um, if we look at macromolecules, and we look at the breakdown of macromolecules, that is the process of catabolism, we see that one of the most common intermediates that is formed from the breakdown of macromolecules is acetyl-CoA. You've already seen this, how glucose can produce acetyl-CoA by producing pyruvate, and the decarboxylation of pyruvate yields acetyl-CoA when oxygen is present. Okay? I told you briefly that if we break down fats and we break down fatty acids, that the products of that are also acetyl-CoA. We don't talk too much in this class about uh, amino acid metabolism. We will talk about it a little bit near the end when I talk about nitrogen metabolism. But suffice it to say that many of the 20 amino acids break down to intermediates that include acetyl-CoA. It's one of the reasons why we can use amino acids as a source of energy for our cells. So acetyl-CoA is really critical for energy metabolism because acetyl-CoA is the starting material, if you want to think about it that way, for the citric acid cycle. It's the input molecule for the citric acid cycle. Okay? And as a consequence of that, the citric acid cycle generates NADH, FADH2, and GTP, all of which are important energy sources for the cell. Okay? NADH and FADH2 get converted back to NAD and FAD by electron transport. The only one shown here is NAD, but FADH2 also gets converted back to FAD by, by electron transport. And the movement of electrons to electron transport is the energy source for the process of oxidative phosphorylation. That's how the ATP is made. 99% of your triphosphates in your cell come as a result of oxidative phosphorylation, not as a result of substrate level phosphorylation. Only a very tiny percent percentage comes from substrate level phosphorylation. And if you forget what substrate level phosphorylation is, that's where that high energy intermediate is directly made. We saw uh, substrate level phosphorylation occurring in the citric acid cycle. When succinyl-CoA went to succinate, we had that high energy bond broken and GDP grabbed the energy to make GTP. When you have a high energy intermediate that leads to synthesis of a triphosphate, that's substrate level phosphorylation. You're going to see that oxidative phosphorylation is a completely different mechanism. It runs like a battery. It's kind of cool. Okay. okay. Now, that's why acetyl-CoA is important, but in addition, to the breakdown processes that I'm talking about here. There's one other consideration for acetyl-CoA that's important, and that's in the metabolism known as ketone body metabolism. So let's spend a minute talking about ketone body metabolism. Okay. What is ketone body metabolism and why is it important? People are interested in ketosis, and I won't really talk about ketosis as a topic, but this does play into that. Ketosis is important because it occurs, one of the ways it occurs is as a result of low concentrations of sugar. Ketosis can be problematic in some cases. Okay. Um, there's a lot of interest in ketosis. There's a lot of interest in, interest in ketone body metabolism. Okay. Why is it important? Well, I've already told you that your body has an almost constant need for glucose. Glucose is the energy source for your eyes, which are one of the biggest users of ATP energy, and the ATP energy is coming from glucose. Your brain is almost totally dependent 
upon glucose for energy. When people get hypoglycemic, meaning they have low concentrations of glucose, they faint because their brain can't keep functioning all the necessary functions to keep them conscious. Okay? Low concentrations of glucose, very low concentrations of glucose can be problematic. People with diabetes, certain types of diabetes will, will frequently get very low concentrations of glucose. They have to carry sugar or some kind of energy source with them because if they don't have that, their concentrations drop far enough that they will, in fact, faint, okay? can die. Right? Well, the body has a backup system for when your glucose concentrations get low. Let's say you go on a starvation diet. Let's say you decide to fast for a long period of time. What's going to happen to your glucose concentrations? Well, the body is pretty good about keeping glucose concentration reasonably constant, but sometimes switching from one system to another, there can be a bit of a gap. That's what happens in diabetics, for example. If the brain is constantly taking and using glucose, and your eyes are taking and using glucose, and you don't have something readily replenishing that, then your glucose concentrations are going to fall. And so the metabolism I'm getting ready to talk to you about here is for that gap between when one system kicks in to help and the other system is still taking that glucose away. Okay? Ketone body metabolism involves acetyl-CoA. Okay? And in ketone body metabolism, what the body is trying to do is to make an intermediate that can travel in the blood like glucose and provide the energy that glucose would have provided without it being glucose. Okay? I'll repeat that. It's trying to make an intermediate that is, that is um, readily uh, uh, tra uh, traveling in the blood, it's soluble in the blood, and it replaces the energy that glucose would have provided. It doesn't replace glucose, but it replaces that energy. And I hope to see, show you how that happens. Well, let's look at the pathway first, metabolically, of what happens, and then we'll talk about how that makes a difference. Okay? Ketone body metabolism involves three molecules of acetyl-CoA. Okay? Three molecules of acetyl-CoA. The first reaction catalyzed by an enzyme called thiolase that you'll learn more about when we talk about fatty acid oxidation, catalyzes the first synthesis. Two molecules of acetyl-CoA come together to make a molecule known as aceto, I'm sorry, acetoacetyl-CoA. A third acetyl-CoA is added, and we make a six-carbon molecule called HMG-CoA, hydroxymethylglutaryl-CoA, all right? You call it known as HMG-CoA, I'll be happy. I don't care if you know the name of acetoacetyl-CoA, but I darn sure want you to know the name of HMG-CoA. Why? Because HMG-CoA turns out to be important not only for ketone body metabolism, but also for cholesterol metabolism. Our body makes cholesterol, and this is an intermediate in the synthesis of cholesterol. This molecule is what I like to refer to as a branch molecule, meaning that it could go to ketone bodies, it could go to make cholesterol. It branches one way versus the other way. Well, we're going to follow it here with respect to ketone body metabolism. And in this pathway, we see what happens. We put an acetyl-CoA up here, and now down here we're taking out an acetyl-CoA. This removal of the second one causes a molecular um, change so that we no longer have a CoA on here. We have a four-carbon molecule known as acetoacetate. So HMG-CoA goes to acetoacetate. It's a four-carbon molecule. Acetoacetate is something we refer to as a ketone body. Acetoacetate is soluble in the aqueous environment of our blood. It can readily travel in our bloodstream. And it can readily be taken out by our brain, by our eyes, and ultimately used as an energy source. Now, there's a problem with acetoacetate. Acetoacetate is chemically unstable. 
boy, great, here's this way to save me, and here's this chemically unstable molecule that's getting put out into the bloodstream. Not going to do me much good, right? Well, the body protects that a little bit by converting some of that acetoacetate into a molecule known as beta-hydroxybutyrate. What it's doing is it's reducing one of those double bond, one of those double bonded oxygens and making a molecule that looks like this. It's actually reducing this back one, okay? Beta-hydroxybutyrate. No, you don't need to know the structure. But you know it has four carbons. Okay. Beta-hydroxybutyrate is also referred to as a ketone body, but if you look at it, that's not even a ketone. This guy at least is a ketone because of that double bonded oxygen. This isn't even a ketone, but we call it a ketone body because I guess we're stupid, right? This ketone body travels in the bloodstream also, and it's more stable. It's one of the reasons the body makes this. But not all of this gets made into this. Some of this acetoacetate is traveling in the bloodstream, and some of this acetoacetate, which I said is chemically unstable, is breaking down. And when it breaks down, <coughs> excuse me, what is it making? It's making acetone. This reaction going to the left is a non-enzymatic process. Cells hate non-enzymatic processes. They absolutely hate non-enzymatic processes because cells are control freaks. And through enzymes, cells can exert control. But if reactions happen in the absence of enzymes, cells lose that control. Cells hate these kinds of processes. Okay? Well, nonetheless, it happens, or shit happens, depending on how you want to say it. Because acetone really isn't of much use to the cell or to the body. And it also travels in the bloodstream, and it goes to the lungs, and you exhale it. Acetone is the stuff that's used in fingernail polish remover. Acetone, you had an organic chemistry, and you probably, if I say acetone, it conjures up a memory of what that smells like, right? If you ever smell acetone on somebody's breath, which you can do, you should ask them, are, are you diabetic? Because one of the things that diabetics get, because their glucose concentrations drop really low, ketone body production happens, is they start producing acetone as a byproduct of what I just described to you. Many people discover they're diabetic without even knowing they're diabetic because somebody told them, I smell acetone on your breath. Now maybe, the, the, because you smell acetone doesn't mean they're diabetic. If you're really low in glucose, if you're really on a very careful diet and so forth, you may also be having this happen. But it's worth asking the question because a person who's diabetic should know. They should get it checked out, okay? Now, I haven't told you how this energetically is helpful to you. I've told you about how you can know if you're diabetic. How in the world is this thing and this thing helpful to a person who has low levels of glucose? Well, you're not gonna like the answer I'm gonna give you, but it's actually true. It's important because all these reactions that I've just shown to you are reversible. They're all reversible. So when the brain cell takes up beta-hydroxybutyrate, or it takes up acetoacetate, the concentrations of those are sufficiently high, because they're taking these things up, that what happens to the process? The reactions start running backwards. They start running upwards. And when they run upwards, what's the end product of this process? Acetyl-CoA. And what is acetyl-CoA useful for, folks? Citric acid cycle. And citric acid cycle is useful for energy. This is an emergency supply of energy that the body is using to deliver to tissues that need it when glucose concentrations are low. Make sense? Everybody's in awe at this point. Oh, they're all shut up, right? I see some frowns. Frowns usually mean either I don't like that or I don't understand. So I, I see a hand. Yes, hand. So does your body keep a store of uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate or 
Does your body keep a supply of beta-hydroxybutyrate sitting around? No, it does not. It starts synthesizing that when the glucose concentration gets low. And this happens in your liver. Yes? Why would the cell choose to go through this pathway instead of using the excess of acetyl-CoA to convert back to pyruvate and then go to glucose regenesis and reduce OK, so why doesn't the cell use acetyl-CoA to go backwards and make pyruvate and use that to make glucose? Because the cell can't do that. The cell can't use acetyl-CoA as a source of pyruvate, and that's why it can't make glucose from it. So it's not possible. That, that, that is relevant if you have a glyoxylate cycle where you can make oxaloacetate and then do gluconeogenesis. You can't do that uh, if you're an animal. Yes? So these both act like glucose because either one of these, acetoacetate or beta-hydroxybutyrate, when they go upwards, are going to make acetyl-CoA. They both will act, not acting like glucose, but they're replacing the energy of glucose. They're not like glucose in any way. Is there one that's favored more? Because it's acetyl-acetate. Is there one that's favored more? Well, look at the pathway. It has to go through here, right? So if we talk about favored, the body favors this one because it's stabler, right? But it still has to go through this to get up to here. OK? So it's not an either or. They're codependent on each other. Yes? Why do you go through this whole? Very good question. Very good question. Because of where this is occurring. This is occurring in the liver. The liver is supplying this to the brain and eyes. Okay? So the liver's got plenty of this stuff sitting around. Your liver's full of uh, fatty acids. Your liver's full of, of amino acids. It's full of all kinds of things. But it, th those don't just get dumped into the bloodstream to get uh, energy. This is being dumped into the bloodstream. So it's a very good question. And we'll talk about this later. Because the movement of materials in the bloodstream, we're talking about one part of the body communicating with another part of the body. And your liver plays a, plays a really critical role in that. I hope Dr. McFadden talked about that with respect to uh, Cori cycle. Did you talk about Cori cycle last term? No? no? Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, I can't do it here, but I'll tell you more about the Cori cycle later. Cori cycle is a fascinating cycle. It's a really good example of this. It's basically your liver talking to your muscle cells. Oh, hell, why not? All right. So what if I get a little behind? All right, Cori cycle, all right? Review of sugar metabolism, all right? Where does gluconeogenesis occur? Did you guys cover that last term? Where does gluconeogenesis occur? Two tissues. Where? Liver and kidney, basically a portion of the kidney, a small part of the kidney. That's the two places where gluconeogenesis occur. Where is glucose needed? Everywhere. It's needed everywhere. So if you want to maintain constant concentrations of glucose, you either have to be eating constantly, which some people do, OK? Even though most people I know don't eat in their sleep, although maybe they could, right? But you have to either be eating constantly or you have to have something that's modulating that. The thing that's modulating that is your liver. Okay. Now, you synthesize glucose in your liver, so when your glucose concentrations get low, the liver says, oh, wake up, I'm going to put dump glucose out into the bloodstream, right? It dumps glucose out into the bloodstream so that the tissues can grab it and use it as they see fit. Let's imagine that I am running a marathon not that crazy of an idea, guys. <laughs> I have run two half marathons in my life. OK. It's not a crazy idea. I'm running a marathon. Maybe I'm running my half marathon. What are my muscle cells doing? My muscle cells are burning ATP. Because when they're burning ATP, that's how muscular contraction happens. Whenever you see muscular contraction happening, it's always ATP. Required, absolutely. Energy source, gasoline of the cell, right? Got to have all that. Muscle cells are really good at contracting. What do we need to make ATP? Well, I hope I convinced you last time that the most efficient way you can make ATP is by breathing. 
Because I said if you start with glucose and you have oxygen present, you go all the way to the end, you get about 38 ATPs, and if you don't have oxygen present, you get two ATPs. Whoa. So you want to have oxygen present. Well, it turns out that your muscles are so darn good about breaking down ATP that they can use oxygen faster than your blood supply can deliver it. Bad news, guys. Bad news. You wonder why after that first 100 yards when you take a sprint, the legs start feeling a little heavy? You've exhausted the ATPs that you have there, and you've also used oxygen faster than the blood supply can deliver more oxygen. I talked about fermentation, right? What's fermentation important for? Keeping a supply of ATP going. You're only getting two ATPs, but at least it kind of keeps things going. It's better than no ATPs, right? If you only had those two ATPs and you had nothing else, you would, in fact, die. But this is where the Cori cycle comes in, and it's really remarkable and cool. Okay? Muscle cells are using oxygen faster than it can be delivered. When you run out of oxygen, what happens to your concentration of NAD? Decreases, right? NAD concentration decreases. What happens to glycolysis if nothing else happens? It's also going to stop, right? If you had nothing else, you would be dead. But you have fermentation. And what does fermentation do? It regenerates NAD so you can keep glycolysis going. Right? Everybody with me? OK, so you, it generates energy. Well, what is produced in fermentation in animals? Lactic acid. Lactic acid. And it turns out lactic acid is an absolute dead end as far as the muscle cell is concerned. Because the only thing lactic acid can go to is pyruvate. And going back to pyruvate requires NAD, which the muscle cell already doesn't have. So what does the muscle cell do? The muscle cell says, I'm tired of all this pyruvate. Dump it in the bloodstream. Dumps it in the bloodstream because it doesn't want it. Pyruvate goes, I'm sorry, the uh, lactate goes into the bloodstream it travels back to the liver, and the liver says, yum, yum. Why? The liver takes up the lactate because the liver has high concentrations of NAD. Why does the liver have high concentrations of NAD? A, the liver is not exercising. B, the liver is close to your lungs. The oxygen concentration is high in the liver, so the liver has high concentrations of NAD. It converts lactate back to pyruvate. And what can pyruvate be converted into? Acetyl-CoA or, other direction, glucose. I've just described the Cori cycle to you. Now, you didn't realize you learned it, but here you just learned it. All right? Liver makes glucose, dumps glucose into the bloodstream, feeds the muscle cells, which absolutely need glucose, and they need a lot of it because they're only getting two ATPs per glycolysis cycle. Lactate gets produced, lactate gets dumped into the bloodstream, goes back to the liver, gets made into glucose, glucose to the muscle cells, muscle cells to lactate, lactate to the liver. You see the pattern? That's the Cori cycle. Pretty cool, right? So the Cori cycle is how the body manages all of that. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. Um, questions about that? I love the Cori cycle. Okay, so you start to see, I hope one of the things you've taken away today is the interconnectedness of all of these things. We're going to see that this web of connectedness in respiratory control, okay, is even more extensive than what I've talked about here. And when I talk about it relative to electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation, I'm hoping that you'll pick up on that. Now, rather than start with lipids and membranes, perhaps we should have today's song. Okay, and I'm hopeful we will get it to work this time, okay. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser.
Okay, guys, see you on Wednesday of next week.